It took me a couple of years to eventually buy that first house just through analysis paralysis and other stuff. And finally, someone got me over the hump. They asked me the question, you know, when you're looking at decisions like this, what is the best thing that can happen to you? And what is the worst thing that could happen to you? And when I looked at the worst thing that could happen to me, it was okay if someone slipped and fell or there's there's ways to mitigate those risks. Now, what I thought at the time was the best thing that could happen to me was this will go great. I'll cash flow two or three hundred dollars a month and I'll keep doing this over time. And while those things generally happened, the best thing that happened to me was I built the confidence. Yes, real estate works. I know how to do it. And it gave me the confidence to do the second one. So today I have Bill Moeller with Moeller Real Estate. Bill, what's going on, man? Things are great, man. How you doing, Jake? Pretty good. Pretty good. Appreciate you jumping on. Long time coming. I know we've uh, been trying to get this on the books for a while, so really excited to, to have you on today, Phil. Yeah, no, I'm excited to be here and I'm looking forward to our conversation. We can go in a lot of different directions here, so I'm, I'm ready. Awesome. So I've, known, I've had the pleasure of knowing Phil for a few years now, and um, I think... I think everyone's gonna be really excited with the the knowledge bombs you drops today. Will Phil is a uh, is a wealth of knowledge. So, um, Phil, I guess to kind of kick things off, would love to hear a little bit more about your your backstory and you know how you got into real estate. Can you give us a little bit of background on you know how you got into the game? Yeah. So first, really high level. I grew up in an entrepreneurial family around business my whole life as a kid, but I was kind of encouraged to go the safe corporate path as I got into high school and college, which I've thought about maybe why that is. And I think I understand why now, but, but nonetheless, I went down the corporate path. I was in corporate America for a long time, including while I built my real estate portfolio. I graduated college in 05. In 2013, I, we were looking at, my wife was a hairstylist. We're thinking about how do we, how do we reduce her hours? That's evening hours. That's Saturday mornings. We had our first kid shortly before then. Like, what do we do to maybe just supplement our income, have different streams of income and maybe reduce her in, reduce her, like voluntarily reduce her income, which gains her more time to be with, be at home and with our kids. So that was the initial strategy to get into real estate. We bought our first house in 2013. I can keep going on that, but in general, our strategy and why we did it evolved over time, as did our, like what we did to get what we wanted. And that was a balance of money and time and a combination thereof. And I'm happy to go into any, any tangent from there, but at a really high level, we bought that single family house in 2013 with the intent to replace portions of my wife income, my wife's income. And again, that evolved over time. So that's really interesting, Phil. So it sounds like, um, and I've been hearing this more and more, you probably realized, uh, you know, you reached a point where it's like, hey, you know, your wife wanted to be a, a stay at home mom. And you're like, you know, A, that was probably more important to you guys as a family for her to be at home, be with the yep. kids. But you probably quickly realized she, if you were going to get outside help, the amount of money she'd be making in the workforce was actually going to be probably the le less or the same than that outside side help would cost. And now you're having someone else, you know, raise your kids. So it's, it, is that what happened? It seemed like, you know, you're, she wanted to be a stay at home mom uh, for the family, but B, yep. from just like a financial perspective, it made sense as well. Yeah. Well, the other thing I'll say though, is I, I live in the Midwest. The cost of living is not the same as the East coast or the West coast, but absolutely living in like childcare is, ex is still expensive no matter where you are. All, it's all relative. But yeah, the, and the bigger thing was I like, we wanted her to be home in the evenings with the kids. And it wasn't, a lot of people maybe don't have that issue, but as a hairstylist for her, it was going to be Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, those evenings, she's at home. That puts probably a little bit more stress on me to come home and take care of the kids myself. Saturday morning, she's gone. We just can't do things as a family in the evening on Saturday mornings. So we're trying to figure out and rack our brains and all these different ways we could maybe replace that income. Do we start a business? Does she you know, work for herself? And, and it led to real estate ultimately. Awesome. Awesome. So walk me through that. So where do you hear, had you just been listening to the podcast? Was there someone in your network who was investing in real estate? Like, tell me a little bit more about how you identified real estate as the means to solve that problem. A, and then B, would just love to hear the story of that first single family home and how that uh, progressed into uh, to buying more and more. Yeah. So first, why real estate? I had tried like some different small, I'd say very small things, like just kind of curious. I was very light dabbling, but you just keep hearing about real estate. Like it's, it's a long-term game and I was probably too anxious. So I tried some other things, but it's like the long game or all wealthy people that create their wealth in real estate. 
So I had heard enough during that time frame. I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That was probably the, the book or the, the mindset shift that I needed to say, okay, yeah, I'm going to try real estate. Now, in reality, I think that was in 2010, 2011. I'm a slow learner and maybe sometimes a slow, like I'm very just thorough in everything that I do, probably sometimes too thorough over an analysis. So it took me a couple of years, maybe some offers, maybe I lost some relationships with agents, but it took me a couple of years to eventually buy that first house just through analysis paralysis and other stuff. And finally, someone got me over the hump by just saying, they asked me the question, you know, when you're looking at decisions like this, what is the best thing that can happen to you? And what is the worst thing that could happen to you? And when I looked at the worst thing that could happen to me, it was okay, if someone slipped and fell, or there's there was ways to mitigate those risks, right? Maybe I lose $5,000 or $10,000. Like those worst things weren't that bad. Now, what I thought at the time was the best thing that could happen to me was this will go great. I'll cash flow two or $300 a month and I'll keep doing this over time. And while those things generally happened, the best thing that happened to me was I, I built the confidence. Yes, real estate works. I know how to do it. And it gave me the confidence to do the second one. So instead of like that first one didn't get me where I was, what I learned from that first one and the confidence I gained got me to the next one. And then that confidence just kept building and stacking on itself over time. And then- I love that. Or, yeah. I love that, Phil. Yeah, I love, um, I love that mindset of thinking, what is the worst scenario? What is the worst thing that could happen here. And the odds of that happening are so low, right? Like it's so low that thing will happen, but it gives you so much confidence to just have a backup plan if that worst case scenario does pan out. And if the answer is pretty good, then there then now you have no excuse to move forward. And um, I think so you should I, plan I, I on it. And I think you should plan around that stuff and think about those things, but don't like don't don't spend too much time on those because quite frankly we create like we create all the problems in our head like most of the problems that have occurred in our head haven't really happened in reality we've just created them ourselves and i've done i did that i've done that a couple of different times in my path to eventually like leaving my job is what are all the things that can go wrong and i created way more issues <laughs> and added way more stress to myself than i probably had to totally i think there's a famous mark twain quote and it's like there's a lot of bad stuff that have happened in my life some of which has actually happened right something right. to that effect because it's yes. all in your head, right? So um, exactly. that's, that's such good stuff. And then the first deal, you asked about the first deal, Jake. So single family home, I actually, like what really got me over the hump was when I bought it, I actually rented it out by room to some like interns or co-ops where I worked. And, you know, maybe the, the cash flow instead of 50 or 100 bucks was 300 or 400. I don't know. Honestly, it ended up being kind of a pain because there's so much turnover and other stuff. And I didn't have the systems for that. But through that, and it was a basic deal. I almost lost it over a thousand dollars, which would have been ridiculous to lose it over. Right. And I was like, okay, at some point I just got to jump and pull the trigger. But anyway, once I finally did it, it just, it clicked like, okay, the numbers work. I'm paying down debt. There's a little bit of growth in the market, leveraged appreciation, all these different terms that we now know, which I could talk through, but I could just see once I started, oh, this works. Like there's there's five different ways to make money in real estate. And I could start to see those taking place. That's great. Uh, I definitely want to jump into some of those things. And it's funny you mentioned the almost losing the deal after a, a thousand bucks. I feel like too many people will lose a deal. They'll lose a, you know, eight hundred thousand dollar house because they couldn't get it for seven hundred and ninety five thousand. It's just like, hey, if the deal worked at eight hundred, it worked or if it worked at 795 it's going to work at 800 and it's just so short-sighted so i'm i'm sure you're you're happy that you didn't lose the the deal over that thousand dollars because it seems like that deal propelled you into uh all the great things you're doing now yeah absolutely and honestly like it's some of that depends on your strategy but it, like if you're flipping a house okay, the margins are important, it's tight. And like on a smaller deal, 10,000, $20,000 could make sense. Certainly not the thousand I talked about. But if you're looking to buy and hold and, and do something over five or 10 or 15 years, those small numbers are not gonna matter. They're not gonna impact your returns in the long run. Quite frankly, like on that 10,000 you mentioned, you're gonna bring maybe a thousand more and you're gonna, or 2,000 more and borrow 8,000 of that. So it's such a small impact. But I, I don't know that I had the lens then that I do now. And again, that thousand dollars that I almost lost it over wasn't that that didn't matter. It's what I learned from the process that, you know, propelled me, propelled me forward. And that's so important, right? It's just getting in the game. I say it all the time. The most important thing is just getting into that first deal and, and obviously be responsible about it, right? Don't buy a stupid deal. Underwrite the deal, 
learn, but eventually you got to take action because you know you can read these books, listen to these podcasts all day, but if you don't take action and get into the game, it's just not the same. That's the best way to learn. Yep. So yeah, I'm sure you were stoked that you you didn't let that thousand dollars blow up the deal for you. I, um, I was. <laughs> So what 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 happened after that, Phil? So you rented out by the room. Um, you didn't let the thousand dollars swap the deal, which was great. You got into this single family house. You were you know making a little bit more cash flow than you might you might have uh, renting it out normally, which is you know great. But it sounded like there were some headaches with it. What what was phase two for Phil back then? Yeah. So leading up to that, it probably took two, two and a half years, whatever it was, I forget the exact time frame to buy that first deal. But then once I learned, I'm like, okay, this makes sense. So four months later, I bought the next deal. Four months later, I bought a duplex, right? Four months later, I bought, so I was buying four to five single family houses or duplexes for about the next four years, maybe six, some years, maybe three, one year, depending on the market a little bit, but it, it just got me over the hump. At a couple of deals in, I learned the Burr strategy, buy, rehab, uh, rent, refinance, repeat, where I was like, I bought a deal with a home equity line of credit. I put whatever, 10K to fix it up, but we were able to finance the whole thing because it appraised. So I basically flipped it and was able to pull the cash out. And that was another light bulb that's like, okay, I can accelerate this and do faster. But anyway, I that gave me the confidence. I started buying some every three to four months for four years. But then there was a point in time where, okay, now we're at like, 20 doors or so. And we're, you know, my wife at this time has, I was successful in reducing her hours, but now she's doing property management and other tasks that she didn't really, you know, never had planned for. And there was a moment in time where it's like, where do we take this? Do we go from 20 doors to 60? Do we, do we stop? Do we sell these? Because something happened with a tenant. I don't remember the specifics of it, but, but Marcia said, I like she said I didn't sign up for this which is like yeah you you did you married me so sorry about that but anyway <laughs> it was kind of a turning point right and it was it was it was a stressful period but it made us make a shift and that's when we shifted into multifamily so we started taking action on how do we find multifamily dues, what, deals what do we do and it ultimately led to our, our first larger deal. Got it. That's that's super interesting. So she stepped away from her full time gig uh, in the hair industry, and then really without you know over time, kind of stepped into being a full time property manager. And I'm sure that was difficult with just a bunch of scattered sing single family homes, right? Because there's no economies of scale. They're all individual assets, right? You don't have the economies of scale Correct. that you have with uh, multifamily, which I'm sure you're going to talk about. Yep. Uh, but that's that's really interesting. Um, and and how much were you buying these single family homes for, Phil? Well, I, I what mentioned was like the average profile. I mentioned uh, we're in the Midwest, so we were we were buying in the how the prices have changed. I and mean, this is in 2013 to 2016. But the price range, like the cheapest one we bought, was probably 40 to 50k. The, those properties are probably all worth 150 plus now, whether I own them or not, that's what they would be worth now. And we bought some up to 120,000. So like of the 25 or so doors we have, we maybe have 10 left and they're the values in today's market are in the 150 to 200 range, I'd say after we finish the work on them. So that kind of gives you some context. Single family, honestly, three bed, one bath, brick ranches are, are great and tenants stay, res residents stay in those for a long time. So that's, that's crazy. Uh, <laughs> just as a sidebar to think, you know, in the last uh, less than 10 years, the ho the prices of these homes have tripled. And I'm sure some of that is a testament to real estate, which, which I would say it's a testament to real estate. I don't know if you'd agree, but man, it goes to show how rapid inflation has run. 3x in a nine-year period is uh, as much as I'd love to say that's all real estate is not the norm. Yep. Um, so that's, that's pretty wild, but I guess it goes to show it's the best way to keep up with inflation is, is by real estate, right? Yeah. And there's such a hedge on it. And quite frankly, the other thing I love is like leverage appreciation. So if we bought a property for let's say 80 K, but we put 20 down, but if it grows, I'll use an easier number. If we bought a property for a hundred K and we put 20 K down on it, and if it grows by 5% a year, well, that first year, 5% over the 25 we put down is 20% growth just on the appreciation. So if you're leveraging in a wise way, you have cash flow, you have margin on it. But if you're leveraging, you can quadruple your returns of the appreciation element of real estate, which is honestly has been game changing from a long term equity growth perspective. Totally. And I feel like I, I'll go toe to toe with anybody who argues with me that real estate isn't the best investment for that reason alone. And that's before you even get into 
all the great things like the tax benefits, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact that you're able to leverage your money and then get the appreciation on that leveraged money, I tell people, show me another asset you can do that with. You can't buy a stock that way. I'll tell you that. Well, so just think uh, about the banks. I think the banks know best. I mean, just do you trust the banks to know best? And then what will banks lend on? How much will they lend on a business? And what terms will they give you? What will they lend on? They don't lend on the market unless it's a line of credit against real estate or something else collateral against it. So just look at what banks are willing to lend against. They love to lend against real assets. That's what they like to lend on. So if you trust them, like they trust real estate the most long term. Yeah, totally. And it sounds like actually going back to something you said earlier, it sounds like you actually pulled out a HELOC on your primary home to invest in more of these deals. Is that right? Yeah. So we would we would we were user HELOC. We would so if we had, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollars of equity, let's say in our in our house, we would leverage up to a certain amount of that, let's say eighty percent. We would buy the property with quote cash with the HELOC, which allows us to then submit what's perceived or considered a cash offer that's not contingent upon additional financing. So we would buy it for, let's say, 60K or whatever it is. We'd use that to put another 10K into it. And then once we had the 70 or whatever it was into that property, if it appraised 100, 100, we could borrow that 70 back on a separate loan specifically against that property and free up our HELOC for the next project. Such a great strategy. Such a great strategy. And yeah, it goes to show to your point, uh, these banks are, you know, they, they have the underlying asset and uh, as, as a first lien uh, to lend on with these HELOCs. So they they feel good about it. And that, you know, they like real estate to back up their loan. Yep. So it's really a win-win, uh, the HELOCs. So obviously, fast forward to today, lots of successful commercial properties. I'd love to hear the story. You kind of started talking about it, uh, about why you made the jump, but would love to hear why you made the jump from residential to commercial. And tell me about that story, because that's a big jump to make. And, I, and I'm curious to hear about that story. Yeah. So first of all, the, the, the main driver of it, and there was some outcomes that I would, I would tell your audience that are other benefits of, of commercial or larger assets, but the main driver was scale. Every time we wanted to buy a property, we had to onboard. I mean, we had to do inspections for that individual house. We had to do the, just review like any documents. We had to do the pro forma. Like there was all this work for every single house or duplex that we had to do, where if we bought a 16 unit, okay, we just saved, you know, 15, we just have to do that one time. We don't have to do it 16 times. So we saved ourselves doing that an extra 15 times. In addition, scale of just growth over time, because I think the other challenge was with single family, it was cash flowing, it was good, but there was capital events and like other costs that we had, where it was like, okay, I think our purpose or vision also shifted. So now Marsha was working less. I don't know if she wasn't working at all, perhaps, but she was helping with management. But now my vision had shifted to, do I have to keep working long-term or can, can real estate be the vehicle to get me out of my W-2 career, which eventually it did, did of course. But that shift in mindset or shift in goals and what we were trying to do and why created the shift in, okay, how do we get there? The shift in the strategy and in scaling up. So that's why we did it. Um, I would say one of the major benefits that we didn't plan for in multifamily was the component of value add. Real estate is evaluated as a business based on NOI or net operating income. And if you can, you know, if you can fix up the property, put some capital into it, if you can do marketing better than other people or just better than the prior owner, if you can add value and add NOI, you're adding equity to the property by growing your income. So I get to grow my income. And if I grow my income, I'm grow growing my total balance sheet as well. So much good stuff there. I definitely want to dig into that, but wanted to go back to the the W2 component. So are you so you're telling me that you built this not only the single family portfolio, but you actually scaled into larger multifamily properties all while still working the full-time W-2. Yeah. So the way the time, so in 2013, we started in single family. In 2017, we shifted to multifamily. We bought a, a 50 unit with four partners and then a 16 unit, then a 70 unit, um, and then some other, you know, a 20 unit, another 70 unit in, in, that, 20, in that 2017 to 2021 timeframe. And as we accumulated some of those properties, and 
our cash flow slowly, slowly grew in 2021 is when I pulled the trigger and eventually left my W2 based on the cash flow we had, what we saw coming and the equity we had built, which equity equity also in like even the single family homes was a key component of getting me to quit my job because I knew I could exercise that if I really needed the cash or if I had to. Totally. And I think, uh, so Phil and I are in a, uh, a pod together for a, a mastermind group we're in called Go Abundance. And Phil, I think, I think right when you joined the pod is when you left the W2 in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. So yes, um, it was shortly it, after that. Correct. That's re- that's really exciting. It's funny. People will probably sit here and listen and say, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe that you built this while working the W-2. I have a similar story. I uh, I built a, a portfolio of uh, short-term rentals while still working the W-2. So it's 100% possible. Phil did it at an even larger scale, right? So it's possible. And it's something that I preach all the time is create those additional income streams while you're still working the W-2. Sure, it's hard. Sure, you're going to work some extra hours, but it puts you in a much more confident place to take that leap of faith versus if you have no other income sources, you can make it happen. Don't get me wrong. You can make it happen, but you're going to be a lot more stressed out. If you already, if you get the side hustle going while you still have the W-2 income, I mean, how much easier was that transition, Phil? It's probably still stressful, right? Still, you're taking the leap of faith. It's something new, but like you feel a lot more solid about it, right? Oh, absolutely. And and again, I had I had some cash flow. It didn't I, honestly, it didn't completely replace my W two income, but there, the cash flow was there. The big thing was when you had like whether it's single family or just a diverse set of investments or streams of income, I could I could say, hey, what if I needed in 2022? What if I would have needed fifty thousand dollars to live off of? I could have just sold one of those single family houses and pulled that cash out to live off of. So I did the math and I said, okay, if I keep doing this, I have at least, like I just sell one house a year for a decade and I still have houses and multifamily left. And now I have a decade to figure out like what I want to do and how to make money. Like if I can't figure this out in a decade, then what what's wrong, right? So um, fortunately, I never had to leverage like the ca- we were, we've been able to just live off of the cash flow and then that equity with those single families. We were able to if we sold those, we would just roll it into another investment for sure. And that goes back to I think what we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast is just thinking through what the worst scenario is, and that's perfect, yep. right? You thought what's worst scenario here, and that's a not a horrible scenario. And surprise, surprise, that scenario didn't play out because we make up everything in our head. Uh, you have probably yes. haven't had to sell a single fam, uh, single house, right? Because you, you know the cash flow started rolling in, things appreciated, sold. You know, there's some other stuff came to fruition. So, um, super interesting. So, yeah, and definitely during that transition, Jake, you kind of asked this earlier, but the yep. mindset of leaving my W two and all the issues I created in my head, and honestly, I created all these issues, <laughs> and then when I left, none of them happened. And actually, <laughs> you know, if I was able to work ten or twenty hours a week before I left my W two on real estate. Now I was able to work 40 to 50 hours a week. So I doubled my capacity of time to figure things out that I hadn't really planned for. Like you have time to figure things out, but also if if you're thinking about a transition, I doubled, probably tripled the capacity I had to go find new deals. And, and ironically or not, um, in 2021, after I had left, I, we, I think we bought three different properties that year through just networking, connecting, kind of building the acquisitions funnel, if you will. So the long-term impact of leaving that year and what's how that compounds through relationships relationships I've built then or since then, um, you know, I, I don't know how I don't know how I'd measure that, but that adds up. That can that could be very significant. So interesting. And how are you uh buying these deals, Phil? So it sounded like you didn't you know, you, you no longer had the W-2 income. Um, and these, similar to a lot of commercial properties, um, you know, you're making your money at the refi and the exit. Yeah, that's where you're making the abundance of your money. And then there's some cash flow it's spitting off. But right. it doesn't sound like these things were, you know, cash flowing in this wild amount each month where you were just stacking an egregious amount of chips. So how how were you funded? You you guys scaled fast. It sounds like you bought a 20 unit, a 30 unit, then another 20 unit like that. That 
that's a lot of property. Yeah. Are you guys raising money or how'd that work? No, it was it was our own capital, myself and a partner. But that year, so the one deal we had, we had in contract and closed before I left. That was a large one. But then later that year, we bought, I think, a, a 20, a 6, which the 6 was just a reposition and sell, and then a 50 unit. But the key is like in real estate, yes, they're looking at me and my total kind of global debt service coverage and living expenses and make sure I'm fine. And I was, and the banks could see that. But the nice thing about real estate is they're also looking at that asset and what that asset will do, how that mm. specific asset will perform. And, you know, I just, I spent a lot of time putting together kind of a business plan for these different assets and why they will work well, in addition to being organized with my own financials and being able to present that. And I think the banks like just having that stuff all tidied up and put together. But yeah, just having a plan, being organized with financials. And then the big thing about real estate is, as I said earlier, banks like real estate. And as long as they trust the operator, which I think is more important important than real estate. But if they trust the operator and they like real estate, you can get financing. Now, if you're leaving your W-2 or thinking that, definitely be strategic about that exit. And when you do it, you know, maybe you wait until you get a deal done or something like that. But yeah, that that's how it evolved for me. That's so interesting, Phil. And I do remember you showed, I've seen some of your decks and business plans and they're extremely in-depth. And I don't think that's talked about enough. That's such a good point that I feel like people think of the banks as like, and the underwriting process is like cookie cutter, like do this, don't do that. Have this DTI, don't have that. And it's like, there is a human element to it, especially when you're working with some of these local banks, it's very relationship based. And like, there's a human behind, you know, the other side of that wall, uh, who's like Correct. saying, Hey, is Phil a good operator? And oh, wow, look at this deck. These numbers make sense. Look how in depth this is. And then after you get the first one done, they're probably like, Okay, wow, Phil actually executed on this plan. It just becomes easier and easier. So it really is like a relationship and uh, skill game showing how good you are and how knowledgeable you are. And it's not just all about your DTI, for instance. Yeah. And look, in passive investing, like people talk about a lot, but you should look at the, the sponsor then the market it's in, and then the deal. I'm sure banks think about it the same way. They're looking at the operator or the sponsor. Who is like who is this person that's going to, I'm borrowing this money to, to operate this thing well? They're probably looking at that first. They're looking at your resume. They're looking at your bio. They're ensuring that you're a good borrower and you're going to operate this thing well and not run it into the ground. They're looking at that and then the asset. And yes, the asset has to work. The property has to work, but they're absolutely looking at both. Interesting. And you mentioned that you, when you originally got into multifamily, I wanted to circle back to this. You said that the value add component was kind of like a bonus that you figured out along the way. I'd be curious to hear more about that because I know a lot of people getting into the game, that's like a major reason they got in. So that must have been a, a pleasant surprise and curious to just hear about that journey, um, what you were thinking going in, if, if value add wasn't a key strategy when you came to the realization that, it, it, you know, played a key role and how that evolution progressed. Yeah, it's kind of similar to when I started single family, I saw it all start to work. Like I had heard value add, I had heard about it and I just didn't see it put into practice. So the main reason I went to multifamily was because of scale. The main thing I saw from multifamily was, oh, this value add component is very, very real. This is a real thing. This stacks up. This this can really add some equity. So I had heard it, but it's just like you you talked about it, get in the game, right? You can educate yourself. And I think that's really important. You, sur you should surround yourself with people that you want to, um, that you just perceive as successful in an area of life. You should see what they're doing and try to copy that. But at the end of the day, you got to get the, in the game. You got to take action. And when you take action, you end up learning way more too. So I had heard value add. I had under, like, I understood how the math worked and what it meant, but I hadn't seen it play out. And I hadn't seen, okay, now you have this equity and you have options to leverage that equity, sell and buy more, refinance at a lower rate and take some out. There's all of a sudden you can look at your return on equity and put your equity to work in different ways when you build it. So just just balancing the cash flow mindset with the equity growth mindset was the big shift I had and value add was a great tool to get me there. Really interesting. Really interesting. And I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about it sounds like you funded all of these your own deals which candidly speaking, I don't, more often than not, I hear about people syndicating deals and using other people's money to buy these commercial deals and maybe putting a little bit of their, their own money into a deal, but really syndicating it from other people 
and then doing a you know LPGP split. Would be curious to hear about you know why you decided to fund those uh, your own deals. If you ever plan on raising money down the line, and then I do know that you've actually been just from our conversation uh, conversations off to the side, actually taking some of your own funds and investing as an LP in other people's deals. So would just be curious to hear like your mindset on that whole thing. Yeah. So really that's the last couple of years has been kind of an evolution for me in figuring out what I want to do, what area I want to focus on. But first, why did, why did we do it ourselves? You know, I, I think working with small local banks, getting into deals and their, the capital they'll bring to the deals on the, like, sorry, the portion of the capital improvement plan they'll bring to the deals helped us get some really favorable financing. Quite frankly, being really organized and having a really good business plan allowed us to get better financing and maybe like not over leverage. Don't over leverage. I'm not saying that, but we just were able to get good financing terms. And um, I had a good W2 that I was able to save up. I had started to you know, build some equity from some other properties uh, that I could just show on my balance sheet too. So quite frankly, why ourselves is because we were able to figure it out by ourselves and re just retain more of the equity. Now, honestly, if I would have done syndications earlier, might I done some bigger, larger deals in the past? Maybe, but I don't know if I was ready for that. I don't know if I was ready for that at that time yet. And I don't know if I was knowledgeable enough, enough at that time to be, you know, using other people's capital to help grow my business. So um, that being said, I feel like I'm in at that point now. So we're actually, we will be, uh, raising capital and bringing in LPs on future deals. Uh, just because, you know, there's a lot of synergies and scale you get now, not just at a 20 unit multifamily or a 70 unit, but a hundred units or above. But with those prices, you know, it'll, it'll require us to bring some capital in from investors. And honestly, I'm excited about the, just getting investors involved in, helping them understand real estate and what it can do for them. You know, th that'll be in an LP position, but I just think having real estate and in income, different income streams and diversification as part of your portfolio is a good strategy. A lot of people are just in the stock market and it just moves up and down with the stock market. Maybe they're diversified within that, but that's what they're in. So to have some element of real estate as someone's strategy, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and you asked about LP. I, I, in 2022, we had some refinances early in the year when rates were still pretty low. So we locked in some nice capital, not some nice debt at really good interest rates at that time. And we just didn't see deals that were penciling at that time in our local market where we were at. But we were able to look at other deals, maybe some other asset classes and diversify into some different investments as an LP. And that's great. Like that, that is just now for me, that's my true passive source of income. Whereas real estate's kind of semi-passive because I'm just in it and I love it. But that's now my source of passive income. But moving forward, I'm going to be the operator, sponsor, uh, sponsor. I'll probably invest some as an LP. But really, my focus is to operate and build our real estate business and, and do some syndications and bring in an investor capital or sell. Really interesting. And do you recommend um, for folks that have the means, whether they have saved you know, a good stack of money from their W-2 or maybe even bringing in a partner who's more, maybe they have a lot of the knowledge in, in real estate and then they have a partner who brings more capital, however they do it. Do you recommend if people have the means to get into their first deal or a couple deals without raising money? Or do you think that there's an argument that, hey, for your first deal, if you have enough knowledge and it's a really solid deal that pencils and you maybe bring in a partner who's a little bit more experienced to you as a newbie, do you think that that uh, you can do your own deal by yourself or you should, you know, you you can raise money? Do you think there's an opportunity to raise money for the first one get, if the circumstances are right? I think if you're brand new, I mean... It you say you have the knowledge, but if you haven't taken the action, you may not have the knowledge, quite frankly. So to do maybe a smaller scale deal first to make sure you have that knowledge or partner with someone that has that knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe you're the capital partner with a couple of folks, whatever it might be. Like, I think partnerships are a way to accelerate this as is raising capital, but I don't think someone should do that in the absence of the right experience. To, sure. If that makes sense. So like, I think someone should have either the experience themselves or partner with someone that has the experience when they're raising capital. And I think, I think LPs should be asking that, like, do you have knowledge of the space? Have you done, even if it's not 
Like if I'm raising money for a hundred unit deal, but I've done a 20, 50, 70 unit deal. Okay. I probably have the knowledge. Like you don't have to do exactly the exact same thing, but if you're brand new to real estate, I think bringing other people in that have the experience would be really important. Totally. That makes sense. Especially when you're raising, you know, uh, money from other people, it's just so, so important. I know as I, um, go out there and, and, and raise money. Like my number one goal or, you know, priority, I should say is I will not lose other people's money under any circumstances. I'll yep. lose my money. Tend to, I will lose hundreds of thousands of dollars of my own money before I would ever lose a penny of investors money because it's it just, you, you can't, you can't do it. Right. So it's so yep. important. And to your point, I feel like if you don't have the experience getting someone on your team, uh, who does have the experience as an advisor, as a partner is just really important just to make sure that everything going good for the first few deals. So that's, those are all yep. really great. Agreed points, 100%. And I think how um, you do that depends on, so it, depends on experience, the money you have and the time availability you have. And I think those are the three factors just to just to assess what your strategy should be. If you have a ton of capital, you have free time, go do it yourself. If you have a ton of capital, but not free time, go find someone that knows what they're doing and, and put your capital to work with that person. So it just depends on what your situation is. But I think understanding your experience, your time and your capital available, and then create your investing strategy around those three things. is For sure. And I feel like even if you're not going to, if you're on the fence about investing like as an LP or maybe venturing out and doing your own deals, I think it's smart for every single person to like, let's say you're interested in multifamily and you're like, you have a solid W2 and you want to get in the game at some point, but maybe you don't have the time yet or you don't have the experience. You should still educate yourself as much as possible on how to underwrite a deal. I think there's yes. way too much uh, group think out there in terms of, and hey, I'm guilty of it. I'm sure you've been guilty of it too, Phil. You know someone who knows someone is like, yeah, so-and-so is a really good operator. Like this deal, is, it's got to be good. And you kind of underwrite it, but not really. But I think you should be underwriting like a, a deal as an LP, the same you would as a GP, like deep underwriting and understanding the deal. It's good practice, A, for if you ever do your own deal, but B, like you're putting your hard earned money into the deal. You should understand yourself at a fundamental level. Forget what John over here says, who knows this stuff. Like you should understand why this is a good deal. Yes, a hundred percent. I mean, I, I, like I had created for, for limited partners when we were doing a lot of work as past investors, like a one page summary, which gets you to ask, quite frankly, ask a lot of questions, understand the financial plan, understand the business plan, understand why, like in the mo the motives of what people are doing. Um, like just ask a couple of the why questions as you dig in, because anyone can create an Excel sheet or a business plan that says anything. So you're going to present it, like you're going to be presented a good business plan. If someone isn't presenting you a good business plan, I, I don't <laughs> understand why they would do that. It's going to be a good looking business plan. It's probably going to be a nice marketing package. So you like, if they're not, okay, that's an easy disqualifier, but there needs to be additional disqualifiers in interview questions and other things as you're assessing deals just to be thorough um, and make sure like, make sure you're not losing money. Buffett's number one rule is don't lose money. His number two rule is look at rule number one, right? So just make sure you're doing the analysis up front. And by doing that, you're going to learn a ton and it's going to make you a better passive investor in this case over time because of the knowledge you're gaining. For sure. And would you say it's fair to say if you're investing, I've heard this before and it made sense to me, and this is kind of the lens I look at uh, when I'm investing as an LP, if it's a newer operator, is it the norm to get like a better split or a better preferred return? Like if you're going to kind of take roll the dice on a newer operator, you should probably be getting on a risk adjusted basis, you're taking on more risk, right? So you should probably be getting better returns or better upside than if you were to go with a very seasoned operator, correct? Is that is that the standard? Yeah, I mean, I would say, yes, that's how it should be. But in general, the market the market return is going to be, you know, maybe if it was 15 to 17% a couple of years ago now, maybe it's more like 12 to 15% IRR. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that fluctuates and the terms fluctuate. I guess if I was to pick one or the other, and maybe this depends on how risk averse the investor is, you're going to have, there's going to be more waterfall and more dilution with larger operators or more seasoned operators. 
And I think that's probably, especially that's probably a, a better way to start. Mm -hmm. However, it, it just depends on your knowledge. Like if you don't have as much knowledge, you should go to someone that has more knowledge. Whereas if you're really experienced, you might take more bets on a smaller operator or less experienced operator, but just make sure there's like margin in the business plan, I guess. I, I, so I don't know, long winded answer to say still be thorough and that smaller operator might project better returns and better terms, but there might be things in the Excel sheet that they're creating too, that they just don't understand, or maybe they're being less conservative. There also can be operators that have been around for a while that can do really good, fancy marketing packages. There's a lot of ways to assess a deal and the sponsor, the market, other things. So interesting. Interesting. Um, I want to shift gears and talk a little bit more about um, what you're up to today. I know just from talking to you off the side, you're doing a, you know, a lot around education and mentorship and meetups and masterminds. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, that. And then you touched upon kind of some of the syndication stuff you're moving into. But I guess two part question, A, from a real estate perspective, where you're going next, Phil, and what your goals are around that and your vision. And then B, kind of the non quote unquote, non real estate activities, such as those things I, I mentioned, the mastermind, the education, the meetups and, uh, and all that good stuff. Yeah. So first, so really I have two areas of focus. It's real estate and real estate acquisitions and operations is one. And then the educational platform and building that out is the second one. So for real estate, you know, our goal this year is to buy $10 million in assets. Quite frankly, we, we actually have something in contract that will beat that. So I probably need to reset my goal. Um, <laughs> but we have a, we have a we have a target for three years from now of a certain um, income and then a certain basically number or financial number that w we will donate as a company and that's really what's driving my real estate business growth. The other thing is I just I want to build a team in house that has a phenomenal culture with just great team teammates and team members that wins together. That's part of my vision is just building a team that wins together in house for what we do and what we operate. And also, and then the other part is the educational piece, which you know I think about this a lot. But like inspire and educate others to live their purpose is what, really what gets me excited. That's kind of my mission statement. And I I see a lot of you know you said just take action, just get in the game. But I see a lot of people that don't take action or don't get in the game and they're not doing anything. And I encourage people like clarify your purpose of what you want, educate yourself on that, network and associate with others, take action because you're also gonna learn from that and build confidence and that's gonna lead to more action and then be an example in whatever you're doing so others can learn from you. That's really what gets me juiced up and my educational platform will be around that. I just feel like, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. We've been blessed in a lot of different ways. And if I can help people by being on your podcast, by having my own podcast, whatever it might be, and they just get nuggets of wisdom, whether that's business or relationships or health, whatever that is, if I can provide just some tactics or nuggets of wisdom that has a small impact on people, that that's fulfilling for me. That's great stuff, Phil. And uh, I love that quote, what you said, you know, taking action, you know, breeds confidence, which enables you to take more action. And it's just yep. like a self-fulfilling prophecy loop. And I think everyone can probably resonate with this. You know, I don't know if you've ever, you know, started going to the gym and all of a sudden you start getting in shape, right? You, you know, start putting on muscle, start feeling better about yourself. Like you're so much more likely to keep working out because you're like, man, I, I love how I feel. I, you know, I'm starting to love how I look. Uh, then, you know, you're three days into working out for the first time. There's zero results. And you're like, ah, oh, this is this is hard. I'm sore. Why am I doing this? It's the same thing with just taking action, getting in the game. You start making some cash flow. You start realizing, hey, I, I actually know what I'm doing. I'm good at this. And it's like so much easier to take that next step. So it's just yep. the first step that's hardest. But once you get over that hump, it's just so much easier. It's downhill sledding at that point. And and the part I I skipped, and then we could talk like health and wellness and business is like, what's your vision, purpose, and why? So like for business, you know, at first, maybe that's to help fund you personally and get you to financial freedom. But maybe over time, that's OK. You can create more experiences for your family. But then is it OK, I can create experiences or or donate to other people and like think about your purpose for that bucket for health. For me, a long time, it was what I looked like when I was younger. But now it's more OK. I want to have energy for my kids and my grandkids. That's what I think about. And that I don't have grandkids, by the way. I'm not that old. So. 
I have young kids right now, but I want to be able to have energy for them every single day. And I want to have energy for my grandkids if that's in 20 or 30 years from now or whatever it might be. So just building your mindset around your goals, I think is so important. And then the education association, you know, taking action, uh, follow that. But I think just starting with your purpose and your, your vision of why, like for me, health is, has been great because if I work out, I'm going to sleep better tonight and I'm going to have a better tomorrow because of it. I'm going to have more energy tomorrow because of what I did today. So it's, it, it also, it almost in health becomes an instant gratification thing where like, if I do what I'm supposed to today, I have a better tomorrow. Like that's a pretty short term benefit I can get from that. So totally. And uh, yeah, you're going to need tons of energy, Phil, because I know you already have like a baseball team full of kids right now. I think you have six, not, six, not kids. baseball, <laughs> basketball well, team and only, basketball, only five yeah. basketball, no subs. I'm the sub only five. So take it easy on me, Jake. But yes, it's uh, they do keep me busy and we're, we're very blessed. They're, they're all healthy and and good kids. So we're pretty lucky. Love that. And if they keep up the Mueller tradition, you know, I think doing some quick math here, five times five, I mean, you're going to have grandkids in the twenties. So you're going to, you're going to need a ton of energy for sure. But in all seriousness, the, yeah, I mean, the health component is something I harp on personally. Um, it's just, I think regardless of what you're doing, you're working the W2, you're starting your own business. I mean, you're just trying to be a show up better in your relationships uh, with your significant other, with your friends, like every aspect of life, health and wellness is just such an important part, right? Like your energy levels, how you're feeling, like physically, how you're feeling mentally about yourself. Um, and then not to mention what you just talked about, like longevity wise, you're going to freaking live longer, right? You're going to live yep. longer if you take care of yourself, you're going to look better. Like every I don't think there's a single other thing out there besides health and wellness where it's just like only positives. It's literally a positive across the board in every aspect of your life. And I think it's just overlooked. There's too many people just burning the midnight oil on both ends of things. And they think that's like the heroic thing to do, but they're eating like crap. They're not sleeping. They're not exercising. It's like, you're just doing yourself a disservice, man. You're, you're not, and playing, I, you're not performing as good as you can. Right. Yep. And I honestly, I think there's either limiting beliefs or excuses around that because like what I told myself for a long time was, you know, health's not that important. Like I'm going to put faith in others first or something, right? I could say that, but honestly, if I'm not taking care of myself, I'm not going to be very good for my kids or my, or for my wife, Marsha. Like I'm, I'm not going to be there with my A game if I'm not personally healthy or don't have the energy that I should. So, um, again, I think there's just, there's, it's, I don't even know if it's limiting beliefs or excuses in the health field. It is hard. It takes work and effort, but it's so worth it. Be, the results you get for yourself and for others, because you can show up being a better version of you if you're healthy. So that's my rant. Totally. Definitely. And I, and I think it's easy to just start making like small changes. I, I don't think it needs to be this whole overhaul overnight where you're someone who you know, lifts weights five times a week and, you know, cuts out all the bad foods and like, just make tiny changes. Like, are you drinking soda today? All right. Maybe just keep eating how you're eating, but don't drink soda anymore. Just drink right. water. Like you'll probably lose 15 pounds in a month. Are you yes. walking at all? Like, all right, you don't need to start running five miles a day. You could just start walking a little bit. Like there's another huge shift, like just these really incremental changes where you don't need to change a ton in your life and you'll see like a huge shift and then you can get more and more advanced, but just some small changes to start. You'll feel so much better. Yep, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So Phil, um, I guess to kind of wrap things up, um, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Really, you know, enjoyed getting to to learn more about your story, starting with residential, going all the way into commercial, and then hearing a little bit more about you know all the great educational stuff you you know you plan on doing next and giving back. Which anyone who has the opportunity to learn from Phil, I could not recommend it more. He's a fantastic teacher and uh, is just a wealth of knowledge. Like you just keep peeling back the onion with Phil and learn there's so so much more knowledge uh that that's there and it never ends so uh yeah i highly recommend to, to anyone who has the opportunity to work with phil um phil but where where can uh people find out more about you if they they want to hear more about all this great stuff you have going on yeah first of all jake i appreciate the kind words uh, just so everyone knows i learned everything i know from jake so um <laughs> it, it should go right back to him if people want to find out more about me they can our podcast is the molar real estate and business podcast and just like jake i'm just trying to 
help people with their real estate business journey, but also mixing in some personal topics to try to help people out. So I appreciate the follow there. Our website is www.molerre.com. And then you can find me, Phil Moeller, on LinkedIn or other social media platforms as well. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for the time, Phil. It's been awesome uh, chatting with you today. Awesome, man. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks, Jake.